Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity. And congratulations to Rutul and the PSG committee for the fifth year in a row. And uh, thank you, Dakshita, for making my job easy with that wonderful talk on classification. Even though it may be a single slide, I think it becomes each time, as you showed with the cases, when we see a patient, it might be that one time we're seeing her and to analyze as to what is happening with her so that you may best treat her. And this is a great segue to my talk. Again, you may think metabolic disturbance in GDM. Isn't GDM a metabolic disturbance? So it may be one slide, but I could talk forever on that one slide, right? So I thought just to make it easy for the audience, we really need to start thinking pregnancy is something that is so natural, so physiological. How do we go about in our mind thinking about this as a normal physiological event? And if you can walk your way through this, you will know you are trying to protect A, the fetus, B, the mother, right? That's what we are always trying to do. And this is your one chance, one time as clinicians, as dietitians, as doctors at any level or healthcare professionals to impact two lives all at once. So this is where I will take our thought process. If you want to understand metabolism, understand it from that point of view. So how do we go about understanding? Why? I think I already answered because we are impacting two lives and we have a chance to have a future window of opportunity to a future baby and the offspring of that baby. And what are the clinical implications which uh, Dakshita has also covered with the HAPO study. So I won't spend much time of course over here. It was just that we know that hyperglycemia and pregnancy should be clearly thought of as pre-gestational diabetes, diabetes during pregnancy and eventually gestational diabetes. As a lot of you might know that I have a huge interest in obesity, pre-maternal weight gain and postnatal weight loss. In fact, my dietitian will be talking about how to manage the mother after she has delivered the baby because that is even much more important for the gestational diabetes mother after the delivery of the baby. So my talk today is that understand this is not a small number. We know US numbers, there's so many pregnancies are complicated. We are in Gujarat and you can see we are in the dark. So the prevalence of GDM is 50 to 20%, which is quite high. Now, why are we talking about this over here? We know all the way back from even before Barker's hypothesis, we had Pillarson and Frankel who spoke about these theories that maternal hypoglycemia or whenever there is maternal hypoglycemia, we are basically trying to provide nutrition to the fetus. If excess of this sugar, if there is fetal overnutrition, the fetal pancreas gets stimulated, which leads to high insulin levels. And this could lead to insulin resistance in the fetus, macrosomia, and several complications, which will be discussed in other talks today. The placenta to me is the organ of interest in my talk today. The placenta is the biggest metabolic and endocrine change that happens in the woman. Would you all agree? And the placenta is what changes within you. The placenta is what comes out of you. Of course, the baby does. But there's also the placenta that is binding you to this baby. And there is this huge immune response. And what all does the placenta produce is what we'll talk about, which induces this state of insulin resistance within the mother, affects your medications such as sulfonylureas, insulin, metformin. We were just talking about all this today. The primary treatment goal in pregnancy is to prevent the cycle from starting and this can be achieved and can be maintained if you maintain near normal glycemia as much as possible beginning even prior to conception which I think even I heard Dr. Purvi speak about, Dr. Dakshita both told you you need to start with education and prevention is the key. Now why does maternal metabolism change in pregnancy? Very simply put, these are occurring so you can accommodate the rapidly growing tissue, which is the fetus. And for the normal growth and development, we have alterations in happening in maternal fuel metabolism. As the uh, doctor over here from China, he was mentioning the fasting sugar is as low as 60. You can see that and is that normal? Currently, if I say summer sugar is 60, we think of it as hypoglycemia. The placenta is the one that is facilitating all of this. And this is what we are going to look at. The final aim is that we want to have an uninterrupted nutrient supply to the fetus for its growth and energy needs and let's see how this happens. So let's talk about the placenta. We know that the placenta is made of several layers. On the fetus side, you have the cytotrophoblast, you have the syncytiotrophoblast, and you have the fetal capillaries. Now here's the organs of interest, or the, the little things of interest are the glucose transporters. So we know you have all of these glucose transporters and the glucose transport happens. Remember, I have to talk about metabolism, so I'm sorry, I have to take you back to a little bit of 
you know, medical school or your school knowledge, is there is glucose transport happening by several mechanisms, by facilitated diffusion as well as with a sodium coupled transporter. So you have SCL transporters and you have the glucose transporters, which allows the glucose to go from the maternal to the fetal circulation. Now this needs to be done and this is happening as you can see in the first trimester. Look at the number of the glucose transporters and they start increasing in the third trimester. You can see by the colored uh, structures over here. All right. Now let's study as to what is happening in first trimester and then the second and third trimester. What is normal pregnancy fuel metabolism? So remember glucose is a fuel for the body just for all of us too. If we take excess of it, what happens? We put on weight, which is mainly deposited as fat. Same thing happens in the baby. If too much glucose starts getting into the baby, it starts getting deposited in various organs, such as in the liver, as well as in the subscapularis fat. This is shown by Dr. Yagnik and colleagues in studies done comparing Indian babies to neonatal babies even, that not only are we the thin fat Indians, but we also have a thin fat baby phenotype. So insulin basically is an anabolic hormone and glucagon is a catabolic hormone. And the action between these two hormones maintains the maternal plasma glucose. In the first half of pregnancy, there is a facilitated insulin action. And there's in the second half, a stress is induced, which leads to an increased insulin resistance. Dr. Catalano and colleagues have shown all of this data doing even insulin clamps in the pregnant mother. I've not shown the clamps just in the interest of time and the audience today. So let's look at these fasting plasma glucose levels in normal pregnancy and gestational diabetes. So as uh, we just spoke about at preconception, you can see that the fasting sugar is just along the lines of 80 milligrams per deciliter. It falls to around 75 to 77 milligrams in the first trimester. And by the end of third trimester, it could be just below 70, 65 to 70. This is a normal pregnancy. Now, what happens in gestational diabetes? You can see how this number starts to increase. You can see that it's over 90, 95, and it can remain just slightly low, but still above what is considered normal for a pregnant woman. So this is gestational diabetes. Now, this is known as facilitated anabolism. So don't get confused by the words. What's happening is release of several hormones and peptide molecules at the level of the placenta. And what this is doing is the increased estrogen and progesterone leads to a beta cell hyperplasia and insulin secretion, which causes hyperinsulinemia. There is also, even in spite of there being an increased insulin-mediated glucose clearance, the liver is still making a lot of sugar. The hepatic glucose production goes up in the woman who is prone to gestational diabetes. What makes them prone to gestational diabetes? One answer, maybe? <coughs> Katie? Hormones? Yeah, so oh, previous history of GDM, obesity, history in the family, all of that you heard about. So certainly beta cell inactivation. The most important thing that tips them over always, and I'll show you, is it insulin resistance or secretion? And really, every time I read it, I feel instead of understanding, I have more questions than understanding why is 65 to 70 normal in pregnancy, right? I mean, we should all be feeling low sugars. So this is sort of, again, a metabolic change. So think of as hormonal changes and metabolic changes. The estrogen and progesterone are anabolic changes happening in the mother, which is affecting the fetus and causing fat deposition. Okay. So these are the gestational factors. Okay, so a normal non-pregnant woman, there is a glucose stimulus, but you can see over here in normal pregnant woman, this is the insulin secretion. You can see it's going up over here. What I want to show you in gestational diabetes women, do you see the insulin secretion lags behind? As Sir rightfully said, there's a problem at the level of the beta cell. So follow me again. The blue line is in when you start giving an OGTT. In normal women, you have this insulin secretion. Therefore, the glucose comes down. But in the gestational diabetes women, the first phase as well as the second phase of beta cell secretion is affected. And therefore, you can see this high sugar levels. Significantly lower insulin responses at 30 and 60 minutes. And therefore, we have a second talk talking about how to diagnose, which I think is very going to be a very interesting talk as well. Now, we only diagnose them, however, very well in the second and third trimesters. Why is this? Because this is where we start seeing the progressive increase insulin resistance. This is where your placenta is fully developed and it starts causing insulin resistance by releasing several placental hormones and cortisol, several inflammatory markers. Adiponectin goes down, leptin resistance increases. 
So I don't want you to remember everything. If you can remember that the first phase is the anabolic phase, and the second and third trimester is the phase of insulin resistance. The placenta is the largest endocrine organ, and I'll leave you with one more new term today, which I feel all of us need to understand, and we'll get to that slide in just a minute. So increased inflammatory markers also cause this huge inflammatory state affecting your gut microbiota. So at all levels, the pregnant woman has no chance, really speaking, unless we can really start treating her sugars and bringing it down, because she needs to eat adequately for the fetus as well. So the risk factors for GDM, as I just asked you, is all of these previous history of GDM, age more than 40, IVF, as Dakshita showed, high BMI, so gestational weight gain or gesta obesity prior to gestation, previous macrosomia, history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, and other medications such as corticosteroids and antipsychotics. So these are the things as clinicians you should watch out for and make sure you get them to an ideal target body weight. So this is a slide I promised you that I want to talk about. The new uh, hypothesis that we just have in the Frontiers article talks about preconception obesity, which by itself tilts the mother over into a state of metabolic disturbance, coupled with excessive gestational weight gain, and now you have gestational diabetes. So some of you have heard the term diabetes. We talk about diabetes and obesity. So this condition is now, there's a new push for calling it gestational diabetes. Okay, so we have a new concept coming in now known as gestational diabetes. Let me explain to you the inflammation. So you can see the green things are good for you. So the green things are going down, adiponectin, interleukin-10, the Treg molecules which help in reducing inflammation. And the red ones are the ones that are not good for you. So there is increased leptin resistance, increased free fatty acid, which causes a lipotoxicity, increased TNF alpha and interleukin-6, and a reduced pathway of nitric oxide, which prevents against oxidative stress. All of this collectively leads to a heightened insulin resistance and a state like type 2 diabetes and maladaptive metabolic responses. So the new term to keep in mind is gestational diabetes, and you could prevent this at the preconception level again. So I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. So simply put, of course, in the non-pregnant state, you have a good balance between insulin secretion, <coughs> insulin resistance, and the blood glucose stays balanced. When you start getting into a normal pregnancy, you still, if you can maintain this balance. However, by the time you start getting gestational diabetes, insulin secretion has gone down, but also insulin resistance has heightened due to the placenta acting as this very, very potent metabolic and endocrine organ. And therefore, you need to be very vigilant. And I think good dietary advice and counseling through pregnancy is also a must in addition to insulin. Okay, so I, pathophysiology of GDM simplified. So it's just simply to tell you what is the level of, this is some of Dr. Catalano and Gould's data, which shows you that when they even looked at the glucose values, you can see how high the insulin already is in order to try and maintain these glucose levels. But still, we fail, and therefore, the Pedersen's hypothesis, again, to bring home the theory, is whenever there is a carbohydrate surplus in the fetus, it leads to this release of insulin-like growth factors, macrosomia, organomegaly, and future development of metabolic diseases. The Frankel's hypothesis, again, just simply reminds us that it's not simply the glucose, but a function of multiple nutrition factors along with the glucose. So the macrosomia that you see at birth, eventually after birth leads to the future in this baby. As I said, we have a window to protect the child and protect future obesity, metabolic syndrome, IGTDM, and cardiovascular disease. This is the origin of the DOHAD hypothesis or the development of all the diseases that you see right from birth. So this is very important to understand what is the implication of the metabolic disturbances that we spoke about. So I'm going to again go ahead over here. So the cycle of metabolic disease epidemics continues as you can see. What can we do at every level? So this was to show you that epigenetic changes are what we can prevent. So the use of several, you know, all our interventions uses of nutritional interventions, making sure B12, folic acid, all that is replaced in the pregnant mother is very, very important. Very often we give them folic acid, but as Dr. Yagnik has shown in the Pune maternal offspring study, B12 deficiency was a big thing that led to this development of diabetes and obesity and the thin fat neonatal baby. Okay. 
So just to kind of bring home the point before I show you a very complex slide, that other things that have been implicated in the metabolic disturbances of GDM is I'm just going to break it down into four key players. Number one is the neurohormonal network from the placenta. So you need to understand some of these hormones. So I've highlighted over here leptin and adiponectin. Now, leptin is an anorexigenic hormone, so it should bring down the hunger. But what do we see during pregnancy? Leptin resistance. Okay, So leptin resistance is what is not helping with the whole state. Adiponectin, again, is, which is a positive hormone, is going to go down in pregnancy. So GDM is associated with decreased adiponectin. And this also limits fetal growth as well as impairs insulin signaling and amino acid transport. Mm -hmm. Fat tissue. So adipose tissue, there is a reduced adipocyte differentiation and increase in the adipocyte size. This is all taken from Dr. Catalano's paper, which I'll be happy to share with you. And the combination of insulin resistance and reduce adipocyte differentiation now leads to a perpetual state of gluco and lipotoxicity. Lipotoxicity in turn releases TNF alpha, interleukin 6, all of the inflammatory markers which will perpetuate the pathway of insulin resistance. Last but not the least, something we could do very easily is replacement of probiotics or gut microbiota, and you should again do this in the preconception phase. I think I've already spoken about oxidative stress. So to summarize, we could put all this together and look at the pathophysiology of gestational diabetes, similar to the ominous octet diagram of type 2 diabetes. So they are, you know, the same, same, different, different. So type 2 diabetes and GDM are similar, but they are also different. Because we have different classification and value cutoffs. We need to understand that the pregnant mother is two people we are treating. There is insulin resistance at the level of the muscle, at the level of the liver, and there is also the big role that the adipose tissue plays. But this is the player, the placenta and the baby, which induces this additional insulin resistance via the placental leptin pathway, pro-inflammatory cytokines, placental transport being disrupted, and the fetal growth that happens in the second and third trimester. If you have understood these four points today, I think I've been successful. And as I promised, here is a very complex slide putting all of this together. And I've given the reference article, which you should enjoy. Progesterone causes inhibition of immune responses. Estrogens disrupts vasodilatory function and insulin secretion. The human placental lactogen or chorionic somatotropic hormone. Placental growth hormones, leptin, ghrelin, all of these collectively and how they play roles is nicely explained in this article. And I believe I'll stop over here and... Uh, and if there's any questions, we can take them at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the excellent talk. Truly simplified the pathophysiology of GDM. Can we have the big round of applause for that? Thank you, And next also, we have a good orator who has been a part of many national conferences as a speaker. She has many publications to her name. She has been a member of many organizing committee also. We have with us Dr. Ami Sangvi, who is a consultant diabetologist at Sangvi Eye and Diabetes Care Center. Over to you. So, very good evening to everyone present here. Thank you, Chairpersons, for the kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, thank you, Team PSU Diet Connect, Dr. Pansi Sabu, Dr. Ruttal, and Dr. Dharmendra Panchal, for giving me this thought provoking topic. When I was given this topic, I didn't know something like this had so much data behind it. So, in the next 15 minutes of my talk, um, uh, my talk is more of, a, you know, more, more about more studies focusing on the monitoring of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Let's talk about which is better, one hour or two hour post-prandial glucose. So we have in during the last two hours of being here, we have been understanding the fact that both pre-existing and gestational diabetes are associated with multiple maternal and fetal complications. Now there are various methods which are available, which we understood for screening, for diagnosis and even for monitoring. So we have fasting sugars, we have our pre-prandial sugars, our post-prandial sugars and mean 24 hour blood glucose. But the best timing of understanding the postprandial measurements which is one hour or two hour after meals is yet to be determined so hyperglycemia in pregnancy is a contributing factor towards both immediate pregnancy complications and long-term effect on both the mother and the fetus over a life course perspective therefore 
adequate management and monitoring is extremely important. Now, when we talk about uh, management and monitoring, monitoring comes first. So, ADA guidelines, the latest guidelines, ADA 2023 guidelines, what do they have to say? That when we're talking about our fasting sugars and our postprandial sugars, they say that they are, it is recommended in both gestational diabetes and pre-existing diabetes. The uh, targets for them are fasting less than 95, 1 hour less than 140 and 2 hour less than 120 milligram per deciliter. A1C, we all know that the turnover of RBCs is the increase in pregnancy and that's why HbA1c can be a little lower in people uh, and pregnant ladies and the guidelines say that ideally it should be less than 6 if the patient is not having any hypoglycemia. But you may relax the A1c targets if the patient is experiencing hypoglycemia. Continuous glucose monitoring, the guidelines say that it is in addition to the pre and post prandial glucose monitoring to achieve a good glycemic control in terms of A1C targets. <coughs> so maternal hypoglycemia has been shown to be strongly associated with fetal macrosomia and several other neonatal metabolic complications. What I need to focus here uh, is that in women without diabetes, the peak glucose rises seen at one hour post prandial. The importance of obtaining an optimal glycemic control during the antenatal care of GDM population is commonly accepted. But the optimal timings of bus, uh, the post prandial glucose me uh, measurements is yet to be determined. Why? Because there are no universally accepted consensus on glycemic goals in the treatment of GDM because data on the effect of different glycemic targets on pregnancy outcomes are limited. Even during the HAPO study, they have seen that as the sugars rise after the 75 hour grams of glucose load, there is increased incidence of complications in the mother who is having high sugars or as the GTD goes higher. So despite behavioral and pharmacological treatment, the rate of maternal and neonatal complications in pregnancies complicated with gestational diabetes is still higher than in the general population. Now coming to the million dollar question, which is better, one hour or two hours? So when I looked up the data, research, digged and filtered, these are the few studies which I found were kind of, you know, proving some point in terms of which is better or are both the same. So I would just focus on this study before going into one hour or two hours. There was a study which was published in 1993 where they actually said that only fasting sugar is good. You need not do a postprandial sugar because therefore them in that study, the two hour postprandial sugar seemed unnecessary and only the fasting sugar was enough to be associated with complications in terms of macrosomia, shoulder dystocia or cesarean delivery. But this was 30 years back. Times have evolved, guidelines have evolved, things have evolved. We are now in a better position to understand the, uh, uh, the uh, effect of the postprandial blood sugars on both the mother and the fetus. So there was this uh, study which was published in 2016, which was a prospective study where they included 259 women with gestational diabetes. Around 1,531 blood glucose readings were taken between the gestational weeks of 24 and 41. And they measured the postprandial 1, which was 1 hour sugar, and postprandial 2, which was 2 hour sugar postprandial with adverse. And they correlated with adverse perinatal outcomes. Where And what they found was that the PP two sugars, that is postprandial two sugars, were positively correlated with fetal macrosomia. But on adjusted analysis, neither one nor two measurements predicted the perinatal complications. Also what they found was that in addition to PP1 and PP2, neither fasting nor A1C were able to predict the perinatal complications <coughs> or fetal macrosomia. So again, leaving us in a gray zone that whether, you know, which is correct, PP1 or PP2. Again, we had a few studies which showed like this was a good study by BSB. The only problem here was they did a capillary blood glucose instead of being, uh, doing a venous blood glucose. Your 112 women diagnosed with GDM were included in the study population where the, they measured the fasting when the target was less than, uh, 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 for one hour, the target was less than 140 and two hours, the target was less than 120. 66 patients were assigned to the one hour group and 46 patients were assigned to the two hour group. 
glycemic control in terms of A1C was almost similar in both the groups. And what the key findings in this were, in terms of outcomes in gestational week of delivery, fetal weight and percentile, it was similar in both the groups. There was increased rate of macrosomia, large for gestational age and cesarean section in the 2R group, but was not statistically significant. Diet control in the GDM managed by 1R PPG was linked with a reduced rate of insulin therapy initiation and neonatal and obstetric outcomes were not significantly influenced by the timing of the glucose determination, whether it was 1 hour or 2 hour. Now, another thing they found was that insulin treated GDM women managed according to the results of 1 hour were able to achieve greater decrease in A1C and had a significant less macrosomic infants as compared to preprandial levels. So this study, now again this was a Polish study, which they now try to understand if you focus on one hour sugar, whether you keep the targets as 120 or 140, you relax the targets, there they included 438 cockettes in women and the uh, the conclusion from this study was that it showed that use of less stringent criteria for one hour glucose that is less than 140 increases the rate of macrosomia and large for gestational age baby. On the other side, what they saw was lowering the target to 120 not only reduced the risk of gestational, uh, large for gestational age babies and macrosomia without increasing the incidence of small for gestational age baby. Because here now we are worried about hypoglycemia and whether the patient will have small for gestational age baby. Lowering postprandial glycemic target to 120 appeared to be more clinically effective and safe for GDM management was what they concluded in this study. Though no significant differences between the groups were found regarding the need for insulin therapy, the rates of cesarean section or pre-term delivery. Now, one more study which came out from Sri Lanka was comparison of 1-hour versus 2-hour postprandial blood glucose. They did an elaborate study. 69 patients were recruited in group 1, which was postprandial, 1 hour glucose, and 69 in group 2. Look at the basic characteristics. They were similar in both the groups. BMI was almost similar in both the groups with both pre obesity and obese patients. The delivery outcomes, what they found is the gestational age at delivery controlled at 1 hour was more between 37 and 38 weeks, but were controlled at 2 hour. What they found was the gestation, they could actually stretched the delivery till 38 weeks, it was little less as 37 weeks. A1C also was almost similar but a little better in the 1 hour group and the fetal uh, maternal outcomes in the first 1 hour versus 2 hour prandial, uh, post prandial blood glucose optimization, they found that the occurrence of fetal macrosomia was significantly less in the first hour post prandial glucose control. The occurrence of malformation was also less than 5% in both the groups and it indicated a good preconception care for those with pre-existing diabetes mellitus. So the, the, what they concluded from this study was that long-term control of blood glucose was significantly superior among the subjects managed with one hour post prandial glucose with statistically significant favorable A1C results and reduced occurrence of fetal macrosomia. Though further research is needed to assess the glycemic control through the pregnancy, first hour blood glucose <coughs> optimization to that of the second hour. Now this is just a brief about one study which came from Kim et al. What they measured was no increase in the 4-hour GTD, one hour, if the uh, uh, one sugar, uh, first hour GTD was high, there was one group, two hour GTD was high was another group and three hour GTD high was one more group. And what they found was that pregnancies which had one elevated blood glucose after one hour exhibited increase in adverse metallurgy and perinatal outcomes. So many studies have shown over a period of time that targeting one hour glucose becomes more logical in terms of bringing better pre pregnancy outcomes. This was some interesting data which came out that among women, amongst women, even without GDM, those with hyperglycemia at one hour during an OGTT had an worse CV risk profile 
at three months postpartum than women exhibiting elevated two hour or three hour postprandial glucose. So as Dr. Ruchar also said that increase in inflammatory markers and all and this may be just an idea to diagnose these high risk ladies who have a little high elevated one hour sugar may have a higher risk of CV risk. And also the same thing was found that one hour PG may reflect a greater insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction and can be a predictor of increase in diabetes risk in the future. So this was also coming up from one study that increases the metabolic risk for the patient who had one hour higher blood glucose levels even though not frank gestation diabetes. Now last study which was focusing on one hour and two hour sugars but what they found interesting in this study was that abnormal glucose values were different at different times of the day. So look at the key findings. Abnormal glucose values were 2.5 times higher one hour post breakfast, then two hours post uh, one hour po uh, post breakfast, then two hours post breakfast, but two times higher post dinner, two hours than one hour. So it's a little confusing. But what they were trying to say is that you have to do differential manner the measurements that you could impose the in the stricter criteria by recommending say one hour post breakfast and two hours post dinner to understand how the overall glycemic control of the patient is behaving so that you can give better glycemic control and better outcomes. Summarizing this confusing talk of mine, monitoring postprandial glucose at different intervals at one hour or two hour provides distinct insights into the management of hyperglycemia. Choice of timing for glucose measurement post meal can significantly impact the initiation of insulin therapy and dietary adjustments. Studies indicate variable glucose peak times post meal suggesting that one size may not fit all. Different timing, one hour post breakfast and two hours more post dinner may offer stricter and more individualized control of blood glucose levels, potentially improving maternal and fetal outcomes. And one hour OGT T uh, threshold helps to identify childhood obesity and fetal hyperglycemia. So finally concluding, we all here who have gathered are finally looking at pregnancy outcomes which help us to get these smiling and happy mothers and let's try to deliver that. Thank you all for your patient care. Very well explained, madam. Very well explained. Now, uh, inviting Dr. Mayura Kale. Uh, she is a consultant diabetologist and physician at Dr. Kale's Diabetes and Psychiatric Clinic, Aurangabad. Visiting diabetologist in many hospitals. And uh, she is a Pablon certified peer reviewer. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Bansi sir, Dr. Ruttoli, uh, Dr. Narmitra, and Team PhD for this invitation. Uh, I'm trying to make my talk as small as and as practical as possible. So, this is a very common scenario where we come across. <coughs> A first time diagnosed uncontrolled diabetes during pregnancy. Uh, maybe at Metros it is a different trend, I don't know, but where I pre practice as a tier 2 city where the BB uh, screening is very less, very less, and sometimes it is like missed also. So uh, I will be talking more, but uh, more about my setting, but what I did in my patient, but it will be certainly useful to you all also. So these are two major references I have used. I mean, these, these are two very good uh, manuscripts, I would say. One should read them. Uh, this is first case. I have taken two cases. First case is very simple. Primary gravity, 29 years old, 28 weeks of pregnancy. She has BMI pre-gestational 27 kilogram per meter square and mother has type 2 diabetes. Uh, we usually screen even uh, at, we all usually sc uh, screen at 28 weeks of pregnancy. So fasting was 110. To us, post 75 gram of 158. So you know this is GDM. Dr. Dakshita has already well explained uh, what is to be done. Also, it has been uh, discussed in detail. Now coming to this actually case. So this is a 32-year-old female, second gravida, one living uh, baby. Now presently coming with 10 weeks of pregnancy and pre-pregnancy BMI is 28.5 kilogram per meter square. She is moderately sedentary. Fasting is random was 182, and hence we uh, exposed her to OGTT 75 gram and the fasting was 132 and post meal was 252 and HbA1c was 8.8. Though it is not a standard.